welcome to How to Deal When the Shit Gets Real podcast. I'm Rietta. And I'm Connie. And today we're interviewing Wendy Jenkins. So Wendy, how do you deal when shit gets real? Just tell us a little bit about yourself. Well, thank you for having me on. Uh, And well, I guess nowadays I deal with things in a much more resilient way. I didn't always used to though, so I can share more about that. But uh, I would like to think I'm a resilient person because of all the things I've been through and also being able to learn better ways to react to things. I think that's really key. I suppose I should start from the beginning. Well, it's not, not I'm not going to go far back as your little one, <laughs> like the, first, <laughs> the first few weeks. <laughs> but um, yeah, when, when I first realised that uh, life was going to change, was when I was working at Shell at the time. So I was in human resources and actually really loving my job, uh, enjoying, you know, my colleagues and what we were up to. Uh, And I had recently got married to my husband, Gordon. You know, we'd started the fur family, having, you know, the kids, Mm -hmm. (laughs) the the two cats and the dog. Uh, And, yeah, life was going along pretty normally. And... Then I just started feeling a bit unfit uh, and my lungs were just not working like they would normally. And one night I was working back late at Shell and realised that when I got to the car park that the lifts were out. So I thought I didn't want to get locked in the stairwell and no one knew where I was. So I decided to walk up the stair, up the um, car ramp. So there's about, I think, six, seven levels at the time. And all I remember is touching the handle of the car door. And the next thing I knew, I was lying on my back, looking up at the roof of the ceiling of the um, car park. My bag was everywhere. Um, I was bleeding and a bit bruised. And I realized I uh, fainted and actually fallen alongside the car. I must have tried to grab it as I was falling. And then I'd hit my head on the bit of the concrete that the car backs up to. Uh, and I know now not to do this, but I got in the car and drove home. Don't do that oh, after yes. concussion. <laughs> it's, um, yeah, tip number one. And, yeah, the husband took one look at the, you know, the blood and bruising and it was like, what happened to you? I said, I don't know, there's something going on here. So very, uh, yeah, to speed up that part of the story, after seeing a bunch of medical specialists, I wound up at one of the big hospitals here in Melbourne, Australia, where I'm from, uh, being told I had two years to live unless I had a double lung transplant. What was the like lung diagnosis? What is it called? Yeah, it was called primary pulmonary hypertension. And it basically meant that the arteries between my heart and my lungs had got really narrow. And so as you can imagine, the blood was having trouble getting through. So it would push back and put high pressures back on my heart. And the heart would can only withstand that for a certain amount of time. They actually said I was lucky I just didn't have a heart attack on the spot and die wow. after walking up the car ramp. So wow. yes, I was very lucky that I just fainted. Have you ever fainted before? Like, was that like a really big moment for you? Like you've never fainted before in your life? No, I'd never fainted at all. So that was one shock. (laughs) Uh, And that's what made me go to the doctor because it was so unlike me. Um, And I I thought, yeah, I mean, I knew I was a little unfit, but come on, that's that's a bit much. Fainting, And I was taking my time, I thought, walking up the car ramp. Um, You know, perhaps being in the car park on my own late at night in the dark, I was probably a little nervous as well. So I was probably walking quicker and my heart was probably beating quicker than normal. Um, mm-hmm. but yeah, I think it was just a combination of all that. And I, and I had had a long day at work too. So yeah. I was just curious about the fainting. And, Cause we have an aunt that fa- faints all the time. So like, I, that, I don't think that's something she would even think about for you. It was a sign yeah. cause you had never fainted before. And me, yeah. I fainted a couple of times and scared the have living you? shit out of Tom. Yes. Oh, wow. <laughs> Yeah, I have. Mom wanted to wrap me in bubble wrap when I got pregnant. Oh, yeah. <laughs> like, oh, my God. But it's actually because it's it's what it is, is low blood pressure. So mm-hmm. it's nothing. It's nothing crazy. Yeah. But when I got pregnant, my blood pressure became normal, if not almost a little high mm-hmm. when I was nervous. So it's like, oh, don't really have to worry about that. It's not low blood pressure anymore. Yeah. Oh, say there's always a silver lining. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Always something. 
So once they told you (laughs) that you only had two years to live, how did we get from there to needing or needing slash receiving a lung transplant? Well, that was a bit of a journey, actually. And I should also mention that at the time, the doctor said to me, uh, you know, after saying, you know, you've only got two years to live, which was shock in itself. She Absolutely. then went on to say, oh, and by the way, you won't be able to have children and you'll be on medication for life. And the current life expectancy after transplant for lungs is five and a half years uh, in Australia. And that, uh, yeah, and so that was kind of like any one of those on its own would have been really confronting. And then yeah. I kind of was joking. I was like, oh, <laughs> what else? And she said, oh, you know, I think I was serious. Um, well, oh, God. Um, if, you're, if you're going, you know, um, I suppose I should, you know, let you know that, you know, if you, were to, if you were to pass, it would probably be from your lungs rejecting cancer or a respiratory illness. So it was oh, like, God. oh, well, yeah. yeah. And my husband, I just burst into tears. I mean, I'm surprised that's, that's a lot of information all, yeah. all at once. Yes. Yeah. yeah. And I asked her afterwards, I got, actually got to, I think at the time I didn't really like this doctor telling me all this and. And afterwards I got to know her a bit better and she told me that the reason she had done it that way was that she'd had another person very similar to me who'd refused to believe she was that sick and didn't want to go on the transplant list and ended up dying. And she oh, sort of no. said to herself that next time that happened, she was going to shock people into action. So I was the person she shocked. <laughs> gotcha. Uh, yeah. Well, at least that makes it a little bit better. Well, you know, you're not like, oh, yeah. I wasn't just trying to be mean. Well, that's what I initially thought. I said to her, gosh, that was some delivery. And she, you know, once I got to know her and she's like, oh, well, let me let you in on why. So maybe it wasn't the ideal way to be told all of that. Um, I'm, I'm pretty sure it wasn't. But, you know, it <laughs> did shock me into action and I definitely took them seriously and and listened. So, yeah. Her shock value worked. It worked. It did, mm-hmm. <laughs> yes. So, yeah, so getting back to your um, other question, um, I go off on tangents all the time. It's just the way my brain works. From there, they decided before they'd actually put me on the transplant list to try a whole bunch of different other treatments. So they thinned my blood, they slowed the blood down, um, they widened my arteries. They did everything they could to make the flow of the blood Um, as good as it could be to keep me stable and actually to see if it would help and tried a bunch of different trial medications as well but unfortunately none of those worked Um, one of the ones they actually used at the time was um, Viagra so Viagra was initially developed to you know widen arteries and help with you know, blood flow and other things around the body. And then they just discovered that it really helped men <laughs> opening up all the uh, blood vessels. <laughs> I'll leave you to work out the rest. Uh, and so, yeah, so they said at the time, Viagra was fairly new and it actually had a bit of a black market too going on the side. So oh. when they decided to give me the tablets, they literally counted them out and I had to make sure that I always, you know, uh, well, at the end of the trial, I'd, I, they told me I'd have to hand back exactly what I had left and they counted off and, you know, so I wasn't selling any on the black market. That's um, crazy. Now, yeah, yeah, that's how um, new it was. Uh, and so they actually put me on three Viagra tablets a day, which wow. sounds like a lot. Um, yeah. Fortunately, it doesn't have the same effect on females, so it could have been interesting. Um, but my poor husband used to have to go to the pharmacy at the hospital to collect these precious tablets. And <laughs> there was this very attractive Italian female pharmacist there, and she would put them all in a bag, and it was semi-translucent. You could kind of work out what was in there. And a month's supply was quite a lot because each box only had a couple of tablets per box and so yeah he'd have this big bag and she'd like Mr Jenkins your you know your medicines are ready <laughs> and everybody <laughs> like whoa that's a lot of for one man <laughs> so um it was quite a funny story and then actually and you know I don't know if you'll believe me but hopefully I don't know if anyone's ever believed us about this but our dog actually ate one of the tablets. Um, oh, no. It dropped on the floor and he was quick. He was like, you know, a young puppy, uh, sort of age dog. He thought, oh, brilliant, this is for him. Dived on it, swallowed it. We're freaking out going, oh, my God, the dog's eaten the bag or what are we going to do? Um, so we rang the vet 
um, who I think was a bit um, sceptical about the whole thing too. I was like, <laughs> really? The dog's in? Well, yeah, you know, we're not sure what's going to happen and we were looking for signs and, you know, all of that, but no- nothing thankfully happened. Like the vet told oh, us to good. watch him overnight. But, of course, now I'm panicking because I have to explain to the hospital why I'm one tablet short. Oh, God. Um, Yes. And so trying to explain to them that the dog ate it when I'm absolutely sure that they're all thinking that we tried Uh it on Gordon. Right, right. (laughs) Sure, the dog ate it. Yeah, the dog ate it. The dog ate my homework too. Yeah, yeah, I know. (laughs) And it was was true. Like I was ready to, you know, give me a lie detector. Like it was true. (laughs) But um, Like I swear I can't make this up. <laughs> yeah, no, well, that's the thing. I said, oh, well, yeah, why would I even pretend yeah. that story? <laughs> that just... mm-hmm. Did they anyway, end up believing I'm, you? I'm sure this. I don't think they really did. No, <laughs> so, <laughs> but I'm sure they just know. let it go because it was one pill. Well, yeah, that's right. So, but um, yeah, I, I don't know. It was it was quite funny. <laughs> but anyway, what things, medication? Yeah, that's what kind of what. Yeah. What medication can they give you that oh. slows your blood down? I've never heard of that before. Well, I guess it's just helping with the pressures. So oh, instead of okay. it pumping through so quickly, they'd slow it down that way. So, yeah, the combination and thinning it out as well so it was able to get through easier. But, yeah, it just really kept me stable. It never really fixed the problem. Okay. Um, so unfortunately, yeah, after a little while they said, uh, no, I think we're going to have to put you on the list. And, uh, yeah, it was quite, it was a, quite a, um, ordeal to get on the list. There was, I remember three, at least three days of full testing. I was just being wheeled around by all the hospital orderlies from one test to the next, to the next, to the next. They tested everything from top to toe. So, I mean, in a way I was thinking, well, this is a great way to get a health check <laughs> because um, <laughs> if anything else is going on, they're going to know about it. Yeah, um, absolutely. So, yeah, so that was kind of one of the benefits there, another silver lining. By the time I finished all that, they said, yes, I was suitable to go on the list. Uh, and then naively I thought, oh, well, it won't be too long before I get the call. But it took a while. I, uh, you know, I ended up waiting 22 months for my lungs and okay. that was a long time even So back just then. short of so two years. Average. Yeah, just short of And, of course, they told me I only had two years to live. In the meantime, we'd been a couple of years doing trial medications and other things. Now we're at another 22 months. I'm thinking this is getting closer to four years. Like, mm. I was <laughs> You're like, eight. oh, boy, uh-oh. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So, so how long did it yeah. take in total? Was it that four years all in total with all the drug trials and then getting on the list? Yeah, it was about it was about just under, yeah, just under four years in the end. Yeah, I guess it was a bit of a blur. It was a lot of tests and med- medicines and different um, assessments and things. But yeah, we got, yeah, we got through it eventually. Did you and, do anything fun uh, yeah, in the four cold. years? Well, when might you actually go on the transplant list, you're not supposed to be too far from the hospital, obviously, because you don't want to yeah. get the call and you're miles away. So mm. they said uh, ideally I needed to be an hour away from the hospital at any time. Maybe two hours they'd sort of let me occasionally go a bit further. Well, so that kind we of ruins spent, the bucket list. <laughs> um, well, it does. I mean, we were lucky we were in a, you know, the, we're, we were in Melbourne, which is the second biggest city in Australia. So there was certainly plenty to do and within an hour you can get to the mountains and get to the beach Mm -hmm. um so you know there was you know wineries and you know nice towns to visit so we were kind of fortunate and you know if you stretched out to two hours you had even more options so it wasn't terrible like not going to complain too much about it we certainly explored our local area (laughs) we got to know it really well uh and yeah, made the most of that. Because again, we didn't know what was going to happen after the transplant. So it was better to, you know, let's make the most of the time we have. So that's what we did. And, what was like and- a must do while waiting for like the transplant? Like if something happens, I have to do mm-hmm. this. Oh, well, see, a lot of those things I couldn't do. They they were things like, you know, going to certain countries overseas or, mm-hmm. you know, going to particularly good restaurants or yeah just having I guess more experience type things so we we did our best like we we went to um we we were very fortunate in Australia we've got some wonderful restaurants so we made a point of going to some of the really top ones and 
<coughs> wineries and <coughs> excuse me overnight stays at you know cute little bed and breakfasts and yeah so we just tried to make the most of getting out and spending some quality time together and then catching up with family and friends um, making sure that you know I made the the most of seeing everyone as much as I could oh yeah. So, yeah it does focus you on what's important I think your husband made a comment that you had hopes to go to your favorite restaurant in Italy I think it was and then you were told you couldn't go anywhere and do I have that right yeah that yeah that, that, well yes I mean there, there were a number of restaurants that we wanted to go to overseas because we're um yeah we really like our food <laughs> so mm-hmm. um it was one of those too. You know, gourmet trips we'd sort of been thinking of doing so unfortunately yeah that had to go on hold we eventually did get there um once i had the transplant but yeah it was just a bit restrictive but you know it's not the end Makes of the sense. world to you know to still we still had lots that we were able to do so we just focused on that and made the most of it and then we've really not traveled locally ever since because we've done that so much yeah we, oh god yeah i bet <laughs> so oh can, please can we go longer than two hours anywhere anywhere <laughs> so, yeah. yeah that's what we do <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> that's good. Hmm. so yeah so I think um once um yeah once I got the call it was oh it was about two in the morning and we'd actually been out for dinner I'm surprised surprised uh and I'd actually had a couple of glasses of wine I didn't used to do too much of that because I was thinking oh what if I got the call but it'd been so long I kind of got a bit complacent and was thinking oh surely it won't be tonight <laughs> so I'll of have a <laughs> Um, And they never said I couldn't. It was just I always thought, oh, you know, maybe that would be better if I didn't. Anyway, we got the call at 2 in the morning and my first thing I said to the transplant coordinator was, oh, I had a few glasses of wine last night. And she said, oh, don't worry, love, we'll just pump your stomach. If it's a problem, you'll be fine. (laughs) Oh, my goodness. Okay. She, um, Yeah, I was like, all right, okay, what am I in for now? But, uh, yeah, you so you had to prepare yourself. They'd given me this, uh, like, antiseptic type body wash so I had to wash all in that and then turn up at the hospital uh, and then the prep began um, and they give you a Valium to sort of calm the nerves uh, and yeah. I think it it I calmed me, calmed me too much I was sort of saying to the doctor oh while you're there just maybe do a tummy tuck and you know, <laughs> oh, and I'm he's just too looking too at me big. going oh dear she's got no idea what she's in for <laughs> so I think my I think I I think my brain had gone into that mode of what you don't know is probably a good thing. <laughs> so yeah, um, like it's and, fine. Yeah. While you're in there, you can take yeah, some yeah. out. It's yeah, cool. Just, yeah, do a few other things. <laughs> so, uh, and I still had my uh, nail polish on my toes, and I, I, I don't know if my, I think my nan was a nurse. I remember her always saying, "Oh, you always had to remove any nail polish in hospital, so the doctors and nurses could tell how you were doing by looking at your toenails." And I said that to one, and oh, I've got my toenail paint on. And she said why is that an issue I said oh well don't you need to you know look at that to tell how I am and she's like dear you'll be hooked up to so many machines she said we won't be looking at your toenails to work out how well you're doing <laughs> trust me I was like oh yeah that's point. <laughs> so she said, like oh yeah technology <laughs> Yeah, yeah. Oh she, my gosh. So we've, we've gone a come a bit further than your nan's days. <laughs> so that was, um, yeah. And and I did keep them on. It was kind of a defiant thing, I suppose, throughout that I had some control over something. Yeah. Uh, and at one stage, I remember I was in the ICU and my dad was there and I actually got him to touch them up and paint my toes for Aww. the first time ever in my life. <laughs> uh, he was more nervous about that, I think, than anything. <laughs> so, yeah. So yeah. while you were waiting on the transplant list, did you always have to have like a bag packed and ready to go? Yes, definitely. Yes, we had our go-to bag, which um, we took everywhere. Uh, and, I mean, because I was only an hour from home at any time uh, and actually where I worked I was probably only 20 25 minutes from home at any time so we were fairly lucky that it wasn't going to take too long to get get anywhere so I didn't take the bag to work the idea would be that I'd get to the hospital and Gordon would go back home and pick up the bag if that's yeah. when I got the call uh, but I do remember like I'd go to different training courses or work things and Often I'd be there with other, because I've worked for Shell's a big company, I didn't necessarily know everyone. So we'd be in the conference or training room and 
the instructor, often a third party, would be saying to everyone, oh, you all have to have your phones off, no exceptions. And and I, I kind of got a bit of a delight in being able to put my hand up and go, I think I might be able to leave my phone on. And she's, and, and, you know, they'd be like, oh, I don't know. I'd be like, waiting on a double lung transplant call. Oh, yeah, yeah, leave your phone on. That's okay. You can do that. So <laughs> I always got a bit of a, a pleasure by, by being able to say, I think mine's okay. <laughs> so I think I would too. I'm keeping my on. Yeah. Yeah. yeah it was, Just for it was, some fun. You make some Shake fun it up a little it. bit. Yeah, yeah. I'd be the, the same way. Going anyway. It's staying on, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Well, yeah, there's got to be some benefits. Um, yeah. Yeah, and then I think... Well, yeah, yeah, I did have for a while a um a disabled car park pass because I was quite uh, breathless and slow and weak by then. So yeah, that kind of helped me, you know, when we did get out and about to things. Um, but yeah, it was it was a bit of an eye opener actually how people treated you when you pulled up in the car looking fine I wasn't in a wheelchair or I didn't look like I had oh those anything. people and oh I got the awful looks from a lot of people it was it was a yeah a real eye-opener for people who have that long term like I only needed it for the time pre-transplant um, and I found myself you know getting really worked up about it and quite upset that people were thinking I was trying to rot the system when I genuinely needed it like if they had actually followed me from the car they'd see I was absolutely puffing having to stop all the time like there was no way I was fit and healthy you know I just looked at like it when I first got out people are so judgmental Um, yeah they are yeah and and actually um they probably should change the I think at the moment they always have like a wheelchair symbol for yes. disabled parking and that gives the impression to people that you have to be in a wheelchair to kind of be eligible um but yeah they maybe need to change it to yeah. some other types of icons yeah, yeah. they should yeah. change it you're yeah. right I think it's yeah when I was pregnant I was like oh my god why isn't there more pregnancy parking <laughs> yeah well, <that's laughs> because I would be so out of breath like oh my god like in the heat mm. and walking it's like Jesus yeah like yeah. okay I- I've never hunted for um like a car like a parking space until I got pregnant. And then I was like, let me see if I can find the closest one yeah. to the door. Yeah, absolutely. I can imagine. Yeah, that's yeah, it's another group of people that probably need the same, yeah, same support. So yeah. Yeah. But anyway, that's yeah, part of part of the journey. You get some eye open a you get a bit of an insight into how and what other people have gone through for much longer than you. Yeah, mm-hmm. yeah. Yeah. So that first time that you opened your eyes, I mean, I obviously know you're going to be a little groggy, but that first time that you had that recognition when you woke up, how were you feeling? Well, I guess I'm a little disorientated. Uh, I don't recall feeling pain, but I must admit I have very blurry memories of that time. So I don't know if you know, but your brain actually can deliberately block certain memories if it's too traumatic and so that's what's happened to me so there's quite a few of those initial weeks where I remember a couple of very vivid details of things which were very strong memories and then everything else is very blurry Uh, and I think it's just a support thing for me um, because afterwards I got diagnosed with severe depression PTSD so occasionally it will pop out and I'll get a flashback from that time that I haven't remembered since. Um, So we're talking, I'm now 15 and a half years out from transplant, which is the average at the moment for lungs globally um, is around seven years. In fact, in some countries it's even less, Um, but Australia's got one of the highest. So it's still seven seven and a half years. Yeah, it doesn't, it doesn't sound like much though, does it really? But it's, the lungs have got the shortest life expectancy out of all the organs. Um, hearts are next at about 12 years. And then you have your kidneys and livers, which are more like you know, 20 to 25. Um, Why is and that so, for lungs? Yeah. Why is it so small? Oh, because the lungs, you can have so much come into them. So a lot of the other organs are quite, you know, separated, you know, from um they're sort of hidden away in your body for want of a better way of saying it whereas the lungs you know everything you breathe in just goes into them Mm. so they're more susceptible to the outside world 
Um, um, yeah, that's a good like point. That. I didn't even think about it. I was like, but why? <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, that's why. Yeah, that makes and sense. so, um, yeah. Unfortunately, you know, all the bugs and the flus and the respiratory illnesses, and yeah, don't get me started about COVID. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> oh God, those yeah. things just um, play havoc with um, yeah our lungs. Does Australia have like cleaner air? Is that one of the reasons you guys have a higher rate? Uh, no, not necessarily. In fact, where we live in Melbourne, uh, Melbourne's actually got one of the highest um, pollution rates out of all the cities oh, in Melbourne, okay. in Australia. Um, but no, I think we think what it is is that because the transplant teams here are able to really individualise the programs for each patient um, and also that pretty much everything's covered under our public health system. They've got a lot more options and we've got some really great surgeons and clinicians here that uh, they keep getting asked to, you know, go and work overseas, but they stay here, thankfully. Uh, so, yeah, they get the best results of for one and five years out anywhere in the world at the hospital that I'm at. Um, so, yeah, if, if I was going to have a lung transplant, where I had it was the best place to have it. Uh, well, so whenever good. they go overseas to the yeah international conferences, they're always asked, you know, what are you guys doing differently and whatever. But they think it's just because, yeah, they make it so individual. So, for example, if there's a difference between a couple of drugs, they can choose which is the right one. Whereas, you know, like say in America, if it's not on your insurance, then you maybe don't have that as an option. You might have to self-fund it. Gotcha. Um, so we're very fortunate in that way that everything's you know kind of covered so that helps a lot, I think, too. Yeah. And yeah, it's almost like your family now. I feel like the hospital's like my second home, <laughs> which is a bit sad. But um, yeah, you get to know the staff so well that they get to know you so well. And then they mm -hmm. pick up on things quickly, too. Yeah. Yeah. It sounds so, like you yeah, had really amazing yeah. care, which is super important. So mm -hmm. wonderful. Yeah. Yeah. It's made a big difference. Yeah. Very fortunate. So can't, can't complain at all in that sense. So yeah, there's there's lots of um, lots of benefits of yeah having had my transplant where I did. Yeah. So yeah, so now it's just making the making the most of it. And you know, as as I um, sort of alluded to earlier, you know, it wasn't straightforward initially. Um, I really struggled. I'm a bit, I was a bit of a control freak. <laughs> I was a bit of a perfectionist. I like things done a certain way. And when everything's thrown up in the air and you have no control. Um, yeah, that I found that really difficult. So I ended up seeing a psychologist every three weeks for six years just to deal with the issues because it wasn't just the transplant and the short life expectancy. It was the not having children. It was the chronic illness. Yeah, it was yeah. um, a whole bunch of things. And so there was a lot to unpack and <laughs> deal with. Yeah. Uh, so, and yeah, all of those know. things you can't control. I think that's part of it. So now, now knowing what I know about the brain, and realizing that uncertainty is one of the most stressful things that brain deals with because it likes to map things and it likes to have predictability it likes to be able to basically predict if something's a threat or not and it's very difficult for it to do that if it doesn't have all the information and things so uh, yes. yeah I can understand now why I reacted the way I did um, but yeah it's led me to where I am today so it's all happened for the right reason and I obviously wasn't supposed to have kids I was supposed to do other things and have a different impact on the world so that's kind of where I see it yeah, yeah I totally sure. relate to that because I've had anxiety for a long time and one of my big anxiety triggers was not having control so totally mm. relate to to that and how you probably felt so overwhelmed yeah yeah it was it is it was and <clears throat> to some extent it still is a little overwhelming at times but uh yeah I've got much better at coping with things and so when there's change or hiccups in my health um I react much better than I used to <laughs> which is good did you ever so, think that you would be going on 16 years no no um I mean I hoped of but course. I guess uh, I was just every year was a bonus at that point and I it actually was more nerve-wracking getting up to the average so this seven years that they kept talking about 
as I'm getting closer to that, that was making me even more stressed. I was like, what if I don't make the seven years? And then I was like, well, actually, when do you remember? It's actually an average. <laughs> so that means you can go further. It's not a, that's it. And you're going to drop yeah. dead at, you know, the seven. It's year. not a button that, no. that, that, that's, <laughs> yeah. pushed. that's like, okay, yeah. you're yeah, done. Yeah, you're, you're, you're you pushed the button. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> no. And so I had to keep reminding myself that. And then I realized that a lot of other patients are feeling the same way. So Once I started getting over 10 years, um, I made a point of introducing myself to other patients when I was in the hospital for whatever reason and getting chatting with, especially the ones that obviously look like they were new patients that are still there with their suitcases ready to go home, whatever. And I get chatting to them and the look of relief on their faces to meet somebody who was 10 years out and that was proof that you could last longer than seven years was a huge thing for them. (laughs) <laughs> that's my lungs waking up again um and <laughs> yeah I realized the importance of sharing my story because um otherwise what was happening is you go into the clinic waiting room and all you would see would be the sick people because they were there to get a checkup because they weren't feeling too well and so you got a um a biased view of what the rest of the transplant patients were doing Um, And like when I was healthy, I was only going in once every three months. And I remember one time I went in and there was a new nurse and she actually thought I was the carer. She said, oh, where's your patient? And I'm like, what do you mean? I'm the patient. She said, you don't look like a patient. And I was like, what is a patient supposed to look like? And she said, not like you. I was like, oh, right. (laughs) So um, I realised that when I was a new lady, (laughs) I know, I know. Well, she was a new nurse, so maybe that was her one of her her lessons to learn. But there you um, go. yeah, it was yeah, it was good. It was um, I felt good the fact that she didn't think I looked sick. So that was yeah. that was good. Mm. Absolutely. So is that what? So is that what motivated you to start the Longitude Foundation? Yep. Sorry. Um, well, <laughs> yeah, was, the, it was. I was like, oh god. Yeah, no, you <laughs> you did get it pretty right. Longitude. Yeah, it's a bit of a tough oh, okay. We were going to go yes. with another name, but then we realized that um, a, a lung cancer charity already had the other name. So we've we've gone with lung uh, We didn't get in quick enough, but that's all right. We um, <laughs> yeah, It's a bit of a tongue twister sometimes. Uh, yeah, no, it was a combination. So we had uh, previously I'd come into contact with a lady called Margaret Pratt who'd actually had three double lung transplants in the end and wow. she set up a charity to fund lung transplant research uh, and we had a very similar medical background same age when we got transplanted she hadn't been able to have children either so there was a lot of things we kind of related on uh, and so she was actually not well when I met her and she ended up um, passing away from cancer but in the short time I got to know I got involved with her charity and ended up Um, chairing that for some time towards the end and we realized that um, whilst it was terrific it needed a bit of a a facelift and a bit of a new angle and it was named after her and so that was sort of reminding her family a lot and so we decided to um, with the blessing of her husband to close that down and create a new one Um, with all the bells and whistles so we're the same level as a hospital charity now so we can accept funds from all over the place Um, and yeah and so that motivated me to uh, get involved doing that and we brought on you know some great board members and the committee um, and yeah just been going for nearly six and a half years now I think it is so yeah so does that what a hospital level gives you is that you can get more donations is that the difference between like a I don't know, a regular charity. I don't know what other word to use. Yeah. So, well, I'm not sure how it works in America, but here in um, in Australia, we have two uh, levels. So the first is, yeah, like what you would call sort of a nor- normal charity and they can accept donations from members of the public uh, and um, then give them a, a tax receipt and then they can use that um, for, t- for tax deductions. And then the level that we are... It means that we can accept funds from other philanthropic groups as well. So it's not just oh, okay. um, donations to the public. And we can also do our own uh, research and, and other things too. So it's yeah, it's sort of a different level. Um, and it just gives us more scope to be able to do more things uh, and work with other charitable groups too. 
Uh, oh, so, okay. Yeah, it just helps a lot. And then we got a new website with all the bells and, you know, the online donations because previously that wasn't available with the old one. So we just basically, yeah, up- updated a few things and rebranded and, yeah, um, <clears throat> got a bit more a bit more involved with just more wider than the research because that's what the previous charity was just focused on. Now we do advocacy and education and support as well. So it uh, gives us more things that we can help people with. That's amazing. It sounds like a wonderful organization. Yeah, yeah, we're very proud of how far we've come and what we've been able to, to do and some of the uh, things that we've been supporting say like in this the research areas made a big difference to patients um so some of the ways that we uh, now match donors and transplant recipients um, is world leading and is now getting rolled out into other countries as well um so we, the researchers have been working closely with the australian red cross blood bank here and getting down to really small tiny details when it comes to matching so we're talking like epaulette levels which is like tiny little things on proteins and so it's not just your blood type um there's loads more that they match on now um wow. and, and they've now computerized a lot of that too in a computer program so they can now run tests to come up with who's going to be the best match um, based on the data and that's been really improving um, longevity for patients so you, anyone who got matched since that bruise brought in, which is after when I had mine, um, yeah, they're now having much better matches. Uh, so that's just one of the things. And then there's lots of other treatments and different methods they use after transplant, which are helping. And yeah, so we're yeah we're really proud of what they're achieving. And uh, yeah, it's really good to be part of all that and see all these new things coming in. Mm-hmm. So yeah, there's lots of hope. That's wonderful. Connie, what were you going to ask? I saw you, you were ready. What are your hopes for the Longitude Foundation? Uh, well, we've got some, yeah, no, we've got some, some bigger visions and some short-term goals. Uh, so the big vision is to have like a center of transplant excellence. So I don't know if you, I think you possibly have over uh, where you are, you know, ones for cancer and things where it's oh, yeah. like, you have, uh, you know, a one-stop shop and it has everything that you need in the one building. Oh, there you so go. So something yeah. like that for transplants. Yeah, because at the moment a lot of it's sort of spread out um, and, you know, you might have different types of transplants done in different hospitals and so the expertise is sort of spread a bit. Um, so trying to bring all of that together and have one's place so that if people <clears throat> say they need I don't know, like an operation of some other sort, they can still be within that same centre so that everyone can keep an eye on you and it's all, uh, yeah, and even like the mental health side of it and all the allied services, it's all kind of together. So that's sort of the big vision. Uh, And then in the shorter term, it's looking at uh, some of the issues in the transplant journey and how we can help influence that as a third party because often the hospital staff are a bit hands tied with things so yeah um, whereas we're third party so we can come in and advocate for things on behalf of the patients and the caregivers and kind of push through things which you know with the government and that 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 we think is really important are going to make a difference so yeah having some of those goals and then we're also funding three projects at the moment that focus on chronic rejection because about 50% of um, transplant patients get chronic rejection within the first five years. Um, and that's really difficult to kind of deal with. So um, the projects are looking at diagnosing it earlier, um, tr- preventing it and also treating it. So we've got kind of a three pronged attack. Um, yeah. So, yeah, so we've, we've committed to funding that over three years and, and longer probably too, of course, but we've, that's our initial, yep, you're guaranteed for three years that you'll get this funding. Um, and that gives peace of mind too, because I don't know if you realise, but a lot of researchers live year by year. So they're never sure if they're going to get funded for the next year or maybe they're lucky they might get promise of two years. It's mm-hmm. quite rare to get promise of three. 
So we just wanted to give some more commitment because these people have got mortgages and lives and houses and other yeah, things they yeah. need to be able to have security over, but most of them don't. Um, yeah. And I could only imagine, you know, you're, you put a year or say two into the, into researching it. And then it's like, oh crap now what they aren't funding my research okay back to the drawing board yeah. now i have to find something else for somebody to fund yeah or they have to spend so much of their time applying for grants and writing yeah. these ridiculously long application forms that um they're not got enough time to actually do the research <laughs> so it, we just thought that's crazy if we if we're in a position that we can give some comfort and security then we're more than happy to do that so the idea, I think, down the track is that we can try and do it for even longer. But we thought, let's try it with three years to start. And yeah, um, yeah, and, and they've been really grateful. They've been able to lock in the researchers for longer and they they know that they've got to be able to see through the work that they're doing, which is really good. Yeah. yeah. I mean, security is a big deal to most people. So being able to give security is a, it's a huge thing. Yeah, that's right. Especially something so important that can make such a difference to other people. It, that seems crazy that... They should be the first ones we give security to. Oh, yeah. But, um, that's just the way research works, yeah. Underpaid and undervalued. Uh, of course. So, yeah. Of course. Mm. So talk to us about um, ready resilience and what that embodies. Um, yeah, well, ready resilience is my um, business that I run. And so initially, like I was saying, you know, I was having a lot of trouble with the mental health side of the transplant. And after the six years of talking to the psychologist, I kind of decided enough was enough. I was sick of talking about it. Um, and while she'd been very helpful, I needed to kind of make that step and go out on my own. I didn't want to be relying on her for the rest of my life. Um, yeah, although there's of course. Wrong with doing that. If people need mm -hmm. it. That's, that's cool. But for me, I felt that wasn't what I needed. So I went out and was researching other things to deal with stress. And I came across neuroscience-based resilience and absolutely fell in love with it. Like it just made sense to my geeky science brain because I had done a Bachelor of Applied Science um, after school. I was just like, oh, this all makes sense. Now I understand what's going on up there. Oh, I understand why I'm triggered by this or how, uh, why this happens or how I can and change that and so I ended up getting a certification to coach in it um, and since gone on to become a um, yeah, a certified resilience first aid instructor so I can actually roll out and certify other people as well within workplaces um, and it's just sort of gone from there so um, yeah I now work with um, organizations mainly uh, running programs so 90-day programs or I do workshops so um, I've got a, I do online ones and in-person ones. Now that COVID sort of died down a bit, now we're getting more back into the in-person ones, which I really enjoy because they're so much more interactive. Uh, so, yeah, doing that. And then I've just started a new leadership program because as I was dealing with all the teams, um, the leaders were saying to me, oh, you know, how can you help us? <laughs> so I realised that there's a lot, once leaders understand how they how their brains work and how they can help themselves and become more calm and control and you know inspire their team and act as role models um, and then they can also influence their own team members so yeah so the program for that is a 90-day one and it helps them understand how to become a more resilient and inspiring leader using the neuroscience side and yeah, the feedback so far has been really good. I think people really enjoy understanding the why behind why a team member behave, behaves a certain way and how you can, knowing what you know about the brain, change that behaviour or how you can motivate people, how you can um, get better collaboration in the team, even simple things like how it's the better, best way to brainstorm in a team or the best way to um set a vision that everyone's going to be part of so there's so much in that area and I realized that if you help the leader then that automatically starts to help the team as well so yeah yeah so I'm looking forward to that um having a good leader yeah, and is I key. enjoy the one-on-ones yeah well I think so and it's um yeah from what I've been seeing there's a lot of leaders who <clears throat> are really struggling off the back of COVID in particular here in um, I'm not sure if you're aware in Melbourne, we had the longest lockdown in the world 
months. So it was over six months we were locked Oh, wow. For. Why? Total, yeah. <clears throat> and, Do you know why? Uh, well, if you get political, there's a whole, re- whole bunch of reasons. Um, we had... We, I guess we had a fairly conservative government at the time. Um, so Australia's divided up into states and territories and we're in what's called Victoria. So it's the bottom southeast part of Australia. Um, it's the second um, most populated part of Australia. Uh, and, yeah, the um, I guess the way the Victorian government decided to manage COVID was to impose a lot of restrictions. So for a long time, we were not allowed to go further than five kilometres from your house. And only if you were buying groceries, getting medical supplies, exercising, and you had to do that on your own or only with a um, a member of your household um, or walking pets, that kind of thing. Um, And so, yeah, that was our life. So we didn't see family and friends for months and months and months um Ugh, all the borders so were hard. shut down between all the different states and territories um everyone mark the mask mandates there were police out and checking to make sure people were if you got diagnosed with covid that you isolated at home for 14 days and they do door checks knock on the door to make sure you're actually there they issue fines i mean there was it was really <laughs> a lockdown it was a proper lockdown um and there's lots of debate about whether it worked it didn't work we did um for a long time keep it under control um really well and because i think it started in overseas and australia's an island um for a while we weren't too bad because um it didn't really take off as quickly here and by the time it did they had a lot more knowledge about how to deal with it um but yeah it was it was a pretty mentally tough time for a lot of people there were a lot of people that if you can imagine all of that being shut down like every business that wasn't essential services had to shut so lots of people lost their businesses their livelihood um thousands tens and hundreds of thousands of dollars that you know in in some cases um just had to stop um lost houses lost i mean it was there was a lot of bad stuff that came out of it all the kids were homeschooled I don't know if you can imagine homeschooling children of all ages for months and months and months um you know parents weren't in a parents didn't know how to do that Uh, so and then the teachers had to teach all online for months and months and come up with new ways of doing that um it was all the everyone was working from home if they were still working so you know, whole families were now in the house <laughs> trying to do schooling and house and work, and um, it was yeah, it was really tough. And so we've had, um, I mean, I call it a bit of a global trauma, the whole thing. But when yeah, it come, comes to Melbourne in particular, they were really hit hard. A lot of people yeah. here, and and a, there's still a lot of overlap from that um, even now. Was it extra scary for you having had the lung transplant? Yeah, well, initially it definitely was because. Again, that uncertainty factor came into play. I was like, what's going on? What? How am I impacted? What do I have to do? And so I, for, yeah, like pretty much uh, I think nearly a whole year, I didn't go into a grocery store or supermarket at all. Um, so my husband did all of that. Um, we, I just sort of kept kept away from everyone and, and being stuck in an apartment for a long time <laughs> that's one of the things to wonders your head as well and I was very fortunate that I was a resilience coach throughout this because I knew what would help me um, that's so good. when I actually did talk to a doctor slash counsellor um you know after the first year um she actually said actually you're doing pretty well I said yeah no I think I am actually but you know I've got the tools to know what to do and that really drove me to go well I can help others so it really kick-started you know for me the pandemic actually helped my business because people were crying out for training on resilience because it was what everyone needed oh Um, yeah mental health is huge like after covid uh my work um I think that's they did like a survey Mm -hmm. and everybody was like we need more mental health coverage yes everybody yeah yeah and it's still happening now because I think what's happened is a lot of people thought you know 
2022 would be the good year because um, the last two years have been so bad and, and yeah. you know, we've had so much lockdowns and everything. Um, but we actually in Australia um, had a lot of issues. We had um, really big fires and then we had flooding, a um, couple of lots of that, like where people were losing homes and it, it was just one, it seemed, it seemed to be just one thing after another. It was like, we cannot get a break. Um, and so the mindset of everyone had really, like people were really flat and really feeling defeated. Um, and it still continues. And even now people are still finding their feet around flexible working. And yeah. some people love working from home, others don't. And just trying to get that sorted out because that, again, has lots of issues. So people aren't in the work place together um but it's yeah it's hybrid working is good but you've got to manage a whole lot of issues so yeah there's still heaps going on so I'm still yeah. in hot demand <laughs> for, for things. that's um, good for you is, though just good I should, yeah well yeah. that's right I mean that you know I guess you look at you know toilet paper producers and um mask producers and you know there's always people who I guess benefit from whatever's going on um, and I hate the fact that I'm benefiting from other people's mental health issues but the truth is I can help them as well so I focus yeah. on yeah you're you're helping oh, yeah, make the sure. mental health better in the long run yes that's what I plan yeah and it's a really good feeling to be able to do that so so yeah it's a nice thing to invest my time in yeah, for sure. Connie, so, do you want to answer, ask your fun question, Miss Connie? Of course, that's exactly what I was just about to do. Really, Great you took minds. the words right out of my mouth. Great uh, mind. Oh yes. So, if you had one last thing in, to eat in life, what yep. would it be? Like, what would your final meal final be? Meal be. Oh, I think probably. I really love yum cha. I don't know if you um. Is that what you call it? Where you? It's like the dumpling meals they do at Chinese restaurants where oh, okay. um, they bring around the trolleys full of all the different dim sums and yum cha. Mm-hmm. I don't know if you might not have it there, but it's um it's one of our favourite things to do. Um, and then after that, probably have a high tea. So like the English high tea where you have all the little yes. cakes and the cups of tea and the champagne. Love it. And, yeah, so it would be a combination of those two, I think. There's yeah. like this it. little tea place in um like near my house kind of yeah and like my friends were raving about it and then I went to it because like I've gone to nicer teas in like the city mm-hmm. not just one out in the suburbs I'm like yeah. this is a bunch of reclaimed furniture and like yeah. a charcuterie board that I could yeah. make for like ten dollars that they're selling for 20 <laughs> yeah. um I- I'll go into the city for a high tea yeah yeah <laughs> I was yeah, like, I think- um, they, they tried to give me a cupcake from Jewel. Um, I think yeah. like you guys just have to have better, higher expectations Patience. here. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, that's right. I mean, high tea is a high affair. So it's supposed to yeah. be, yeah, be special. I'm not supposed to be getting yeah. a cupcake that I could go and buy from Jewel. Yeah. Yeah. Because yeah, I used the grocery to work store. So I was like, uh, that's it. Yeah. I was like, that's a grocery store cupcake. Yeah. Yeah. No, that's, you can tell the difference, can't you? Yeah. Yes. Oh yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah. So, yes. Was there any that final would, thing you would be. like to leave with our listeners? No, I suppose um, just that if anyone is interested in learning a little bit about neuroscience-based resilience and how it can help people, I've actually got a free um, complimentary, um, I call it my five days of feel good on my website. So if you Ooh, go I like to readyresilience.com, yeah, me too. you can sign up for that and Every day over five days, you'll get sent um, an email which will have different, um, like a different uh, resilience sort of neuro hack around calming and um, dealing with stress. So that would be helpful for anyone. They are very welcome to sign up for that and um, check it out. We'll put all the links in uh, in our show notes for you for Ready Resilience and for the Longitude Foundation, of course, as well. So if anybody wants to learn more about your foundation or if they just need help or whatever it may be. Perfect. Sounds good. Well, thank and this you. is how to deal when shit gets real. See you next episode, guys. Thank you.